This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot blogsome dot com. Today's reading is by Fling93. The book is The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad, and this is Chapter 3. All idolization makes life poor. To beautify it is to take away its character of complexity. It is to destroy it. Leave that to the moralists, my boy. History is made by men, but they do not make it in their heads. The ideas that are born in their consciousness play an insignificant part in the march of events. History is dominated and determined by the tool and the production, by the force of economic conditions. Capitalism has made socialism, and the laws made by the capitalism for the protection of property are responsible for anarchism. No one can tell what form the social organization may take in the future. Then why indulge in prophetic fantasies? At best, they can only interpret the mind of the prophet and can have no objective value. Leave that pastime to the moralist, my boy. Michaelis, the ticket of leaf apostle, was speaking in an even voice, a voice that wheezed as if deadened and oppressed by the layer of fat on his chest. He had come out of a highly hygienic prison, round like a tub, with an enormous stomach and distended cheeks of a pale, semi-transparent complexion, as though for fifteen years the servants of an outraged society had made a point of stuffing him with fattening foods in a damp and lightless cellar, and ever since he had never managed to get his weight down as much as an ounce. It was said that for three seasons running a very wealthy old lady had sent him for a cure to Marienbad, where he was about to share the public curiosity once with a crowned head, but the police on that occasion ordered him to leave within twelve hours. His martyrdom was continued by forbidding him all access to the healing waters, but he was resigned now. With his elbow presenting no appearance of a joint, but more like a bend in a dummy's limb thrown over the back of a chair, he leaned forward slightly over his short and enormous thighs to spit into the grate. Yes, I had the time to think things out a little, he added without emphasis. Society has given me plenty of time for meditation. On the other side of the fireplace, in the horsehair armchair where Mrs. Verloc's mother was generally privileged to sit, Carl Junt giggled grimly, with the faint black grimace of a toothless mouth. The terrorist, as he called himself, was old and bald, with a narrow snow-white wisp of a goatee hanging limply from his chin. An extraordinary expression of underhand malevolence survived in his extinguished eyes. When he rose painfully, the thrusting forward of his skinny, groping hand, deformed by gouty swellings, suggested the effort of a moribund murderer, summoning all his remaining strength for a last stab. He leaned on a thick stick, which trembled under his other hand. "'I have always dreamed,' he mouthed fiercely, "'of a band of men absolute in the resolve to discard all scruples in the choice of means, strong enough to give themselves frankly the name of destroyers, and free from the taint of that resigned pessimism which rots the world. No pity for anything on earth, including themselves, and death enlisted for good and all in the service of humanity. That's what I would have liked to see. His little bald head quivered, imparting a comical vibration to the wisp of white goatee. His enunciation would have been almost totally unintelligible to a stranger. His worn-out passion, resembling in its impotent fierceness the excitement of a senile sensualist, was badly served by a dried throat and toothless gums which seemed to catch the tip of his tongue. Mr. Verloc, established in the corner of the sofa at the other end of the room, emitted two hearty grunts of assent. The old terrorist turned slowly his head on his skinny neck from side to side. And I could never get as many as three such men together. So much for your rotten pessimism, he snarled at Michaelis, who uncrossed his thick legs similar to bolsters, and slid his feet abruptly under his chair in a sign of exasperation. He a pessimist? Preposterous! He cried out that the charge was outrageous. He was so far from pessimism that he saw already the end of all private property coming along logically, unavoidably, by the mere development of its inherent viciousness. The possessors of property had not only to face the awakened proletariat, but they had also to fight amongst themselves. Yes, struggle, warfare was the condition of private ownership. It was fatal. Ah, he did not depend upon emotional excitement to keep up his belief. No declamations, no anger, no visions of blood-red flags waving, or metaphorical lurid suns of vengeance rising above the horizon of a doomed society. Not he, 
cold reason, he boasted, was the basis of his optimism. Yes, optimism. His laborious wheezing stopped. Then, after a gasp or two, he added, Don't you think that, if I had not been the optimist I am, I could not have found in fifteen years some means to cut my throat? And in the last instance, there was always the walls of my cell to dash my head against. The shortness of breath took all fire, all animation out of his voice. His great pale cheeks hung like filled pouches. Seated in front of the fireplace, Comrade Ossipin, ex-medical student, the principal writer of the FP leaflets, stretched out his robust legs, keeping the soles of his boots turned up to the glow in the grate. A bush of crinkly yellow hair topped his red, freckled face with a flattened nose and prominent mouth cast in the rough mold of the Negro type. His almond-shaped eyes leered languidly over the high cheekbones. He wore a gray flannel shirt, the loose ends of a black silk tie hung down the buttoned breast of his serge coat, and his head resting on the back of his chair, his throat largely exposed, he raised to his lips a cigarette in a long wooden tube, puffing jets of smoke straight up at the ceiling. Michaelis pursued his idea, the idea of his solitary reclusion, the thought vouchsafed to his captivity and growing like a faith revealed in visions. He talked to himself, indifferent to the sympathy or hostility of his hearers, indifferent indeed to their presence from the habit he had acquired of thinking aloud hopefully in the solitude of the four whitewashed walls of his cell, in the sepulchral silence of the great blind pile of bricks near a river, sinister and ugly like a colossal mortuary for the socially drowned. He was no good in discussion, not because any amount of argument could shake his faith, but because the mere fact of hearing another voice disconcerted him painfully, confusing his thoughts at once, these thoughts that, for so many years, in a mental solitude more barren than a waterless desert, no living voice had ever combated, commented, or approved. No one interrupted him now, and he made again the confession of his faith, mastering irresistible and complete like an act of grace, the secret of fate discovered in the material side of life, the economic condition of the world responsible for the past and shaping the future, the source of all history, of all ideas, guiding the mental development of mankind and the very impulses of their passion. A harsh laugh from Conrad Ossipin cut the tirade dead short in the sudden faltering of the tongue and the bewildered unsteadiness of the apostle's mildly exalted eyes. He closed them slowly for a moment, as if to collect his routed thoughts. A silence fell, but what with the two gas jets over the table and the glowing grate, the little parlor behind Mr. Verloc's shop had become frightfully hot. Mr. Verloc, getting off the sofa with ponderous reluctance, opened the door leading into the kitchen to get more air, and thus disclosed the innocent Stevie, seated very good and quiet at a deal table, drawing circles, 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 innumerable circles, concentric, eccentric, a coruscating whirl of circles that by their tangled multitude of repeated curves, uniformity of form, and confusion of an intersecting line suggested a rendering of cosmic chaos, the symbolism of a mad art attempting the inconceivable. The artist never turned his head, and in all his soul's application to the task, his back quivered, his thin neck sunk into a deep hollow at the base of the skull, seemed ready to snap. Mr. Verloc, after a grunt of disapproving surprise, returned to the sofa. Alexander Ossipin got up, tall in his threadbare blue serge suit under the low ceiling, shook off the stiffness of long immobility, and strolled away into the kitchen, down two steps, to look over Stevie's shoulder. He came back, pronouncing oracularly, Very good, very characteristic, perfectly typical. What's very good? grunted inquiringly Mr. Verloc, settled again in the corner of the sofa. The other explained his meaning negligently, with a shade of condescension and a toss of his head towards the kitchen. Typical of this form of degeneracy, these drawings, I mean. You would call that lad a degenerate, would you? mumbled Mr. Verloc. Comrade Alexander Ossipin, nicknamed the Doctor, ex-medical student without a degree, afterwards wandering lecturer to working men's associations upon the socialistic aspect of hygiene, author of a popular quasi-medical study in the form of a cheap pamphlet seized promptly by the police, entitled The Corroding Vices of the Middle Classes, special delegate of the more or less mysterious Red Committee, together with Carl Yunt and McCallis for the work of literary propaganda, turned upon the obscure familiar of at least two embassies that glance of insufferable, hopelessly dense sufficiency, which nothing but the frequentation of science can give to the dullness of common mortals. 
That's what he may be called scientifically. Very good type, too, altogether, of that sort of degenerate. It's enough to glance at the lobes of his ears. If you read Lombroso, Mr. Verloc, moody and spread largely on the sofa, continued to look down the row of his waistcoat buttons, but his cheeks became tinged by a faint blush. Of late, even the merest derivative of the word science, a term in itself inoffensive and of indefinite meaning, had the curious power of evoking a definitely offensive mental vision of Mr. Vladimir, in his body as he lived, with an almost supernatural clearness. And this phenomenon, deserving justly to be classed amongst the marvels of science, induced in Mr. Verloc an emotional state of dread and exasperation, tending to express itself in violent swearing. But he said nothing. It was Carl Yunt who was heard, implacable to his last breath. Lombroso is an ass! Comrade Ossipin met the shock of this blasphemy by an awful vacant stare, and the other, his extinguished eyes without gleams blackening the deep shadows under the great bony forehead, mumbled, catching the tip of his tongue between his lips at every second word, as though he were chewing it angrily. Did you ever see such an idiot? For him, the criminal is the prisoner. Simple, is it not? What about those who shut him up there? Forced him in there? Exactly, forced him in there. And what is crime? Does he know that, this imbecile who has made his way in this world of gorged fools by looking at the ears and teeth of a lot of poor luckless devils? Teeth and ears mark the criminal, do they? And what about the law that marks him still better, the pretty branding instrument invented by the overfed to protect themselves against the hungry? Red-hot applications on their vile skins, eh? Can't you smell and hear from here the thick hide of the people burn and sizzle? That's how criminals are made for your lombrosos to write their silly stuff about. The knob of his stick and his legs shook together with passion, whilst the trunk, draped in the wings of the havelock, preserved his historic attitude of defiance. He seemed to sniff the tainted air of social cruelty, to strain his ear for its atrocious sounds. There was an extraordinary force of suggestion in this posturing. The all but morbid veteran of dynamite wars had been a great actor in his time, actor on platforms, in secret assemblies, in private interviews. The famous terrorist had never in his life raised personally as much as his little finger against the social edifice. He was no man of action. He was not even an orator of torrential eloquence sweeping the masses along in the rushing noise and foam of a great enthusiasm. With a more subtle intention, he took the part of an insolent and venomous evoker of sinister impulses which lurk in the blind envy and exasperated vanity of ignorance, in the suffering and misery of poverty, in all the hopeful and noble illusions of righteous anger, pity, and revolt. The shadow of his evil gift clung to him, yet like the smell of a deadly drug in an old vial of poison, emptied now, useless, ready to be thrown away upon the rubbish heap of things that had served their time. Michaelis, the ticket of leave apostle, smiled vaguely with his glued lips. His pasty moon face drooped under the weight of melancholy ascent. He had been a prisoner himself. His own skin had sizzled under the red-hot brand, he murmured softly. But Carmite Ossipin, nicknamed the doctor, had got over the shock by that time. You don't understand, he began disdainfully, but stopped short, intimidated by the dead blackness of the cavernous eyes in the face turned slowly towards him with a blind stare, as if guided only by the sound. He gave the discussion up with a slight shrug of the shoulders. Stevie accustomed to move about disregarded, had got up from the kitchen table, carrying off his drawing to bed with him. He had reached the parlor door in time to receive in full the shock of Carl Jung's eloquent imagery. The sheet of paper covered with circles dropped out of his fingers, and he remained staring at the old terrorist, as if rooted suddenly to the spot by his morbid horror and dread of physical pain. Stevie knew very well that hot iron applied to one's skin hurt very much, his scared eyes blazed with indignation. It would hurt terribly. His mouth dropped open. Michaelis, by staring unwinkingly at the fire, had regained that sentiment of isolation necessary for the continuity of his thought. His optimism had begun to flow from his lips. He saw capitalism doomed in its cradle, born with the poison and the principle of competition in its system, the great capitalists devouring the little capitalists, concentrating the power and the tools of production in great masses, perfecting industrial processes, and in the madness of self-aggrandizement, only preparing, organizing, enriching, making ready the lawful inheritance of the suffering proletariat. 
Michaelis pronounced the great word, patience, and his clear blue glance raised the low ceiling of Mr. Verloc's parlor had a character of seraphic trustfulness. In the doorway, Stevie, calmed, seemed sunk in hebitude. Comrade Ossipin's face twitched with exasperation. Then it's no use doing anything, no use whatever. I don't say that, protested Michaelis gently. His vision of truth had grown so intense that the sound of his strange voice failed to rout it this time. He continued to look down at the red coals. Preparation for the future was necessary, and he was willing to admit that the great change would perhaps come in the upheaval of a revolution. But he argued that revolutionary propaganda was a delicate work of high conscience. It was education of the masters of the world. It should be as careful as education given to kings. He would have it advance its tenets cautiously, even timidly, in our ignorance of the effect that may be produced by any given economic change upon the happiness, the morals, the intellect, the history of mankind. For history is made with tools, not with ideas, and everything is changed by economic conditions, art, philosophy, love, virtue, truth itself. The coals in the grate settled down with a slight crash, and Michaelis, the hermit of visions in the desert of a penitentiary, got up impetuously. Round like a distended balloon, he opened his short, thick arms as if in a pathetically hopeless attempt to embrace and hug to his breast a self-regenerated universe. He gasped with ardor. The future is as certain as the past. Slavery, feudalism, individualism, collectivism. This is the statement of a law, not an empty prophecy. The disdainful pout of Comrade Ossipin's thick lips accentuated the negro type of his face. Nonsense, he said calmly enough. There is no law and no certainty. The teaching propaganda be hanged. What the people knows does not matter, were its knowledge ever so accurate. The only thing that matters to us is the emotional state of the masses. Without emotion, there is no action. He paused and added with a modest firmness. I'm speaking to you scientifically. Scientifically. Eh? What did you say, Verloc? Nothing, growled from the sofa Mr. Verloc, who, provoked by the abhorrent sound, had merely muttered a damn. The venomous spluttering of the old terrorist without teeth was heard. Do you know how I would call the nature of the present economic conditions? I would call it cannibalistic. That's what it is. They are nourishing their greed on the quivering flesh and the warm blood of the people. Nothing else. Stevie swallowed the terrifying statement with an audible gulp, and at once, as though it had been swift poison, sank limply in a sitting posture on the steps of the kitchen door. McCallus gave no sign of having heard anything. His lips seemed glued together for good. Not a quiver passed over his heavy cheeks. With troubled eyes, he looked for his round, hard hat and put it on his round head. His round and obese body seemed to float low between the chairs under the sharp elbow of Carl Yunt. The old terrorist, raising an uncertain and claw-like hand, gave a swaggering tilt to a black felt sombrero shading the hollows and ridges of his wasted face. He got in motion slowly, striking the floor with his stick at every step, it was rather an affair to get him out of the house because, now and then, he would stop, as if to think, and did not offer to move again until impelled forward by Michaelis. The gentle apostle grasped his arm, his arm with brotherly care, and behind him, his hands in his pockets, the robust Ossipan yawned vaguely. A blue cap with a patent leather peak set well at the back of his yellow bush of hair gave him the aspect of a Norwegian sailor bored with the world after a thundering spree. Mr. Verloc saw his guests off the premises, attending them bareheaded, his heavy overcoat hanging open, his eyes on the ground. He closed the door behind their backs with restrained violence, turned the key, shot the bolt. He was not satisfied with his friends. In the light of Mr. Vladimir's philosophy of bomb-throwing, they appeared hopelessly futile. The part of Mr. Verloc in revolutionary politics having been to observe, he could not all at once, either in his own home or in larger assemblies, take the initiative of action. He had to be cautious. Moved by the just indignation of a man well over forty, menaced in what is dearest to him, his repose and his security, he asked himself scornfully what else could have been expected from such a lot, this Carl Yunt, this Michaelis, this Ossipin. Pausing in his intention to turn off the gas burning in the middle of the shop, Mr. Verloc descended into the abyss of moral reflections. With the insight of a kindred temperament, he pronounced his verdict. A lazy lot this Carl Yunt, nursed by a blear-eyed old woman, a woman he had years ago enticed away from a friend and afterwards had tried more than once to shake off into the gutter. 
Jolly lucky for Yunt that she had persisted in coming up time after time, or else there would have been no one now to help him out of the bus by the green park railings where that specter took its constitutional crawl every fine morning. When that indomitable, snarling old witch died, the swaggering specter would have to vanish too. There would be an end to fiery Carl Yunt. And Mr. Verloc's morality was offended also by the optimism of Michaelis. Annexed by his wealthy old lady who had taken lately to sending him to a cottage she had in the country, the ex-prisoner could moon about the shady lanes for days together in a delicious and humanitarian idleness. As to Ossipin, that beggar was sure to want for nothing as long as there were silly girls with savings bank books in the world. And Mr. Verloc, temperamentally identical with his associates, drew fine distinctions in his mind on the strength of insignificant differences. He drew them with a certain complacency, because the instinct of conventional respectability was strong within him, being only overcome by his dislike of all kinds of recognized labor, a temperamental defect which he shared with a large proportion of revolutionary reformers of a given social state. For obviously one does not revolt against the advantages and the opportunities of that state, but against the price which must be paid for the same in the coin of accepted morality, self-restraint, and toil. The majority of revolutionaries are the enemies of discipline and fatigue, mostly. There are natures, too, to whose sense of justice the price exacted looms up monstrously enormous, odious, oppressive, worrying, humiliating, extortionate, intolerable. Those are the fanatics. The remaining portion of social rebels is accounted for by vanity, the mother of all noble and vile illusions, the companion of poets, reformers, charlatans, prophets, and incendiaries. Lost for a whole minute in the abyss of meditation, Mr. Verloc did not reach the depth of these abstract considerations. Perhaps he was not able. In any case, he had not the time. He was pulled up painfully by the sudden recollection of Mr. Vladimir, another of his associates, whom in virtue of subtle moral affinities he was capable of judging correctly. He considered him as dangerous. A shade of envy crept into his thoughts. Loafing was all very well for these fellows who knew not Mr. Vladimir and had women to fall back upon, whereas he had a woman to provide for. At this point, by a simple association of ideas, Mr. Verloc was brought face to face with the necessity of going to bed some time or other that evening. Then why not go now, at once? He sighed. The necessity was not so normally pleasurable as it ought to have been for a man of his age and temperament. He dreaded the demon of sleeplessness, which he felt had marked him for his own. He raised his arm and turned off the flaring gas jet above his head. A bright band of light fell through the parlor door into the part of the shop behind the counter. It enabled Mr. Verloc to ascertain at a glance the number of silver coins in the till. These were but a few, and for the first time since he opened the shop, he took a commercial survey of its value. The survey was unfavorable. He had gone into trade for no commercial reasons. He had been guided in the selection of this peculiar line of business by an instinctive leaning toward shady transactions where money is picked up easily. Moreover, it did not take him out of his own sphere, the sphere which is watched by the police. On the contrary, it gave him a publicly confessed standing in that sphere, and as Mr. Verloc had unconfessed relations which made him familiar with, yet careless of the police, there was a distinct advantage in such a situation. But as a means of livelihood, it was by itself insufficient. He took the cash box out of the drawer, and turning to leave the shop, became aware that Stevie was still downstairs. "'What on earth is he doing there?' Mr. Verloc asked himself. "'What's the meaning of these antics?' He looked dubiously at his brother-in-law, but he did not ask him for information. Mr. Verloc's intercourse with Stevie was limited to the casual mutter of a morning, after breakfast, my boots, and even that was more a communication at large of a need than a direct order or request. Mr. Verloc perceived with some surprise that he did not know really what to say to Stevie. He stood still in the middle of the parlor and looked into the kitchen in silence. Nor yet did he know what would happen if he did say anything and this appeared very queer to Mr. Verloc in view of the fact, borne upon him suddenly, that he had to provide for this fellow, too. He had never given a moment's thought till then to that aspect of Steve's existence. Positively, he did not know how to speak to the lad. He watched him gesticulating and murmuring in the kitchen. Stevie prowled round the table like an excited animal in a cage. A tentative, hadn't you better go to bed now, produced no effect whatever, and Mr. Verloc, abandoning the stony contemplation of his brother-in-law's behavior, crossed the parlor wearily, cash box in hand. The cause of the general lassitude he felt while climbing the stairs being purely mental, he became alarmed by its inexplicable character. 
he hoped he was not sickening for anything. He stopped at the dark landing to examine his sensations, but a slight and continuous sound of snoring pervading the obscurity interfered with their clearness. This sound came from his mother-in-law's room. Another one to provide for, he thought, and on this thought, walked into the bedroom. Mrs. Verloc had fallen asleep with the lamp, no gas was laid upstairs, turned up full on the table by the side of the bed. The light thrown down by the shade fell dazzlingly on the white pillow sunk by the weight of her head, reposing with closed eyes and dark hair done up in several plates for the night. She woke with the sound of her name in her ears, and saw her husband standing over her. Winnie! Winnie! At first she did not stir, lying very quiet and looking at the cash box in Mr. Verloc's hand. But when she understood that her brother was capering all over the place downstairs, she swung out in one sudden movement on to the edge of the bed. Her bare feet, as if poked through the bottom of an unadorned sleeved calico sack, buttoned tightly at neck and wrists, felt over the rug for the slippers while she looked upward into her husband's face. "'I don't know how to manage him,' Mr. Verloc explained peevishly. "'Won't do to leave him downstairs alone with the lights.' She said nothing, glided across the room swiftly, and the door closed upon her white form. Mr. Verloc deposited the cash box on the night table and began the operation of undressing by flinging his overcoat onto a distant chair. His coat and waistcoat followed. He walked about the room in his stockinged feet, and his burly figure, with the hands worrying nervously at his throat, passed and repassed across the long strip of looking-glass in the door of his wife's wardrobe. Then, after slipping his braces off his shoulders, he pulled up violently the Venetian blind and leaned his forehead against the cold window pane. A fragile film of glass stretched between him and the enormity of cold, black, wet, muddy, inhospitable accumulation of bricks, slates, and stones, things in themselves unlovely and unfriendly to man. Mr. Verloc felt the latent unfriendliness of all out of doors with a force approaching to positive bodily anguish. There is no occupation that fails a man more completely than that of a secret agent of police. It's like your horse suddenly falling dead under you in the midst of an uninhabited, and thirsty plain. The comparison occurred to Mr. Verloc because he had sat astride various army horses in his time, and had now the sensation of an incipient fall. The prospect was as black as the window pane against which he was leaning his forehead. And suddenly, the face of Mr. Vladimir, clean-shaved and witty, appeared inhaled in the glow of its rosy complexion like a sort of pink seal impressed in the fatal darkness. This luminous and mutilated vision was so ghastly physically that Mr. Verloc started away from the window letting down the Venetian blinds with a great rattle. This composed and speechless with the apprehension of more such visions, he beheld his wife re-enter the room and get into bed in a calm, business-like manner, which made him feel hopelessly lonely in the world. Mrs. Verloc expressed her surprise at seeing him up yet. "'I don't feel very well,' he muttered, passing his hands over his moist brow. "'Giddiness?' "'Yes, not at all well.' Mrs. Verloc, with all the placidity of an experienced wife, expressed a confident opinion as to the cause, and suggested the usual remedies. But her husband, rooted in the mood middle of the room, shook his lowered head sadly. "'You'll catch a cold standing there,' she observed. Mr. Verloc made an effort, finished undressing, and got into bed. Down below in the quiet, narrow street, measured footsteps approached the house, then died away unhurried and firm, as if the passerby had started to pace out all eternity, from gas lamp to gas lamp, in a night without end and the drowsy ticking of the old clock on the landing became distinctly audible in the bedroom. Mrs. Verloc, on her back, and staring at the ceiling, made a remark. "'Taking's very small today.' Mr. Verloc, in the same position, cleared his throat as if for an important statement, but merely acquired, "'Did you turn off the gas downstairs?' "'Yes, I did,' answered Mrs. Verloc conscientiously. "'That poor boy is in a very excited state tonight,' she murmured, after a pause which lasted for three ticks of the clock. Mr. Verloc cared nothing for Stevie's excitement, but he felt horribly wakeful and dreaded facing the darkness and silence that would follow the extinguishing of the lamp. This dread led him to make the remark that Stevie had disregarded his suggestion to go to bed. Mrs. Verloc, falling into the trap, started to demonstrate at length to her husband that this was not impudence of any sort, but simply excitement. There was no young man of his age in London more willing and docile than Stephen, she affirmed none more affectionate and ready to please, and even useful, as long as people did not upset his poor head. Mrs. Verloc, turning towards her recumbent husband, 
raised herself on her elbow and hung over him in her anxiety that he should believe Stevie to be a useful member of the family. That ardor of protecting compassion, exalted morbidly in her childhood by the misery of another child, tinged her sallow cheeks with a faint, dusky blush, made her big eyes gleam under the dark lids. Mrs. Verloc then looked younger. She looked as young as Winnie used to look, and much more animated than the Winnie of the Belgravian mansion days had ever allowed herself to appear to gentlemen lodgers. Mr. Verloc's anxieties had prevented him from attaching any sense to what his wife was saying. It was as if her voice was talking on the other side of a very thick wall. It was her aspect that recalled him to himself. He appreciated this woman, and the sentiment of this appreciation, stirred by a display of something resembling emotion, only added another pang to his mental anguish. When her voice ceased, he moved uneasily and said, I haven't been feeling well for the last few days. He might have meant this as an opening to a complete confidence. Then Mrs. Verloc laid her head on the pillow again, and staring upward, went on, That boy hears too much of what is talked about here. If I had known they were coming tonight, I would have seen to it that he went to bed at the same time I did. He was out of his mind with something he overheard about eating people's flesh and drinking blood. What's the good of talking like that? There was a note of indignant scorn in her voice. Mr. Verloc was fully responsive now. Ask Carl Yunt, he growled savagely. Mrs. Verloc, with great decision, pronounced Carl Yunt a disgusting old man. She declared openly her affection for Michaelis, of the robust Ossipin, in whose presence she always felt uneasy behind an attitude of stony reserve. She said nothing whatever. In continuing to talk of that brother, who had been for so many years an object of great care and fears, he isn't fit to hear what's said here. He believes it's all true. He knows no better. He gets into his passions over it. Mr. Verloc made no comment. He glared at me, as if he didn't know who I was when I went downstairs. His heart was going like a hammer. He can't help being excitable. I woke Mother up and asked her to sit with him till he went to sleep. It isn't his fault. He's no trouble when he's left alone. Mr. Verloc made no comment. I wish he had never been to school, Mrs. Verloc began again brusquely. He always taking away those newspapers from the window to read. He gets a red face poring over them. We don't get rid of a dozen numbers in a month. They only take up room in the front window. And Mr. Ossipin brings every week a pile of those F.P. tracks to sell at a half penny each. I wouldn't give a half penny for the whole lot. It's silly reading, that's what it is. There's no sale for it. The other day, Stevie got hold of one, and there was a story in it of a German soldier officer tearing half off the ear of a recruit, and nothing was done to him for it. The brute! I couldn't do anything with Stevie that afternoon. The story was enough, too, to make one's blood boil. But what's the use of printing things like that? We aren't German slaves here, thank God. It's not our business, is it? Mr. Verloc made no reply. I had to take the carving knife from the boy, Mrs. Verloc continued, a little sleepily now. He was shouting and stamping and sobbing. He can't stand the notion of any cruelty. He would have struck that officer like a pig if he had seen him then. It's true, too. Some people don't deserve much mercy. Mrs. Verloc's voice ceased, and the expression of her motionless eyes became more and more contemplative and veiled during the long pause. Comfortable, dear? she asked in a faint, faraway voice. Shall I put out the light now? The jury conviction that there was no sleep for him held Mr. Verloc mute and hopelessly inert in his fear of darkness. He made a great effort. Yes, put it out, he said at last in a hollow tone. End of chapter 3